Start clean with Clorox because Clorox delivers a powerful clean every time. Because messes happen. Because... Hey, honey, you know your dad's world-famous chili. Yeah, the one that takes 24 hours to make. So I was trying to help out and bring the pot to the table, but it was, like, super hot. And then I, um, dropped it. And now the floor looks all, you know, stained with chili. Look, the point is, you guys cool with pizza for dinner? <laughs> honey? Ooh, yeah, that happens. So start clean with Clorox. Use Clorox products as directed. Sometimes your cat can be a mystery, like when they get so attached to certain cardboard boxes. <laughs> but when you use Fresh Step Cat Litter, there's no question that you're making your cat happy thanks to amazing odor control. Fresh Step Clumping Cat Litters prevent stinky crumbles and make scooping easy by locking in liquid and odor immediately. That means you can keep your house clean and your bond strong. There's no mystery here. Find Fresh Step Cat Litter at a store near you. Fresh Step is a registered trademark of the Clorox Pet Products Company. Certain trademarks used under license from the Procter & Gamble Company or its affiliate. Hey everyone, it's Ted from Consumer Cellular, the guy in the orange sweater, and this is your wake-up call. If you're paying too much for wireless service, you don't have to keep having that nightmare. Consumer Cellular has the same fast, reliable coverage as the leading carriers for up to half the cost. So why keep spending more than you have to? Seriously, wake up and call 1-888-FREEDOM or visit ConsumerCellular.com. Savings based on cost of Consumer Cellular single line 1, 5, and 10 gig data plans with unlimited talk and text compared to lowest cost single line postpaid unlimited talk text and data plans offered by T-Mobile and Verizon January 2024. How's it going and welcome to episode 102 of On The Wire. Proud member of the Pitcherless Podcast Network. Follow the pod on the Twitter at On The Wire Pod. You can follow me at 80 Great. That's all spelled out. And you can follow my co-host Kevin Hasting at Hasting Kevin. We have a great show lined up for today as we continue our preview episodes. And as I said last week, we're doing things a little bit differently than you may have been hearing. Of course, you find other podcasts doing preview episodes revolving around positions, scarcity, about MLB teams, divisions, whatever. And they all have their merit. Got to learn the player pool. What we're going to be continuing to do is focusing on the actual roto categories that you're trying to actually get throughout the season. We'll be getting into the weeds a little bit on that throughout. But before you, Kevin. Glad to have you back, man. Glad to be back behind the mic. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing well, Adam. It's great to be here as always. Yeah, it's been a very hectic week, but nothing that talking some baseball and fantasy baseball with you and our amazing guest won't take care of. Nice, nice. Yeah, you say hectic. It must be only on your end then because until 20 minutes before prep time, like I had nothing on the news section <laughs> of this rundown. Nothing is happening. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's nice to know things have evened out. There are still some players that I'm waiting to sign. But then all of a sudden, bam, like three things pop through the wire. So we do have things to talk about. And like you said, we have an amazing guest with us this week to talk about th those news. Very happy to get some Cubs news in here because we have with us Sarah Sanchez. You know her from Bleed Cubby Blue. She's in Tout Wars, second place finisher in Tout Wars. and But reigning champion of Glarf in the Earth Fantasy Baseball Network. And today we're going to talk with Sarah about the categories revolving around speed, talking about runs, talking about stolen bases. And we'll get into all that a little bit before we do that. Sarah, I'm just happy to have you. How you doing? I'm doing very well. It is a Friday night over here and I'm excited to end the week chatting some baseball with y'all. And this was a really fun setup the way that you've got this going. I've done a couple of position previews with some other podcasts recently and I loved the way that needing to look at the late rounds and look at the category sort of shifted the question there. So thanks for putting that together. Yeah, absolutely. This is how we do the show throughout the season. Like we do fab targets and of course fab targets are on the wires. So they're probably not drafted in a whole lot of, in a lot of times in especially, you know what, at least a third of the way into the season, you really start focusing on what categories you need to jump up where you can make the most ground, where you can get the most points and move up the standings. And it made sense to do our preview episodes. We didn't do any preview episodes last year, Kevin. So it was kind of nice to have a little bit of more structure and still continue to talk about the strategy revolving around these things that we focus on throughout the course of the season. As I, know, as I mentioned, though, we got some news. We got some Cubs news, so there. I'll make sure that goes to you when we get to that. But talk. To, can you talk to me a little bit about what it is you do with Bleed Cubby Blue, and then what is anything else that's some, that you might be working on there that people? Sh I, we heard you on. I don't want to speak for Kevin. I know I heard you as the resident Cubs expert 
on the Fantasy Baseball Beat recently and did a great job there. And you talked a lot about your work over at Bleak Cubby Blue there as well. Is there anything else you're working on in that realm? Yeah, I've been doing a lot of podcasts lately. I was actually just on Beat the Shift. So if you check out Beat the Shift with Ariel Cohen and Ruben Guy, you'll hear a little bit about, we were talking about outfielders over there just yesterday. At Bleed Cubby Blue, I do most of the sabermetric inclined stuff covering the Cubs and just a lot of Cubs culture types of things. So I've been looking at each of their signings by the numbers. Full disclosure, I am fairly pessimistic on the Cubs this year. Like I am literally in the comments every day arguing with people who are like, this is an 85 win team. And I'm like, it is not. It is a 75 win team. I don't know what you all are smoking. But so I do a lot of sabermetric work over there. I also am the co-host of the Bleed Cubby Blue podcast, which if you pay attention to Vox News and those types of things, SB Nation just like axed most of their podcasts, including us, which was unfortunate, but it seems like a crew of us are getting together an independent network of a whole bunch of team podcasts that should be coming together. So I can't really say much more about that right now, but I will say be on the lookout for that. It should be announced in the next couple of weeks. Make sure you're following me on Twitter at BCB underscore Sarah, no H on the Sarah, and you'll get that that news first and foremost there. And there's pretty good chance there's going to be some good fantasy content in that new network too, including a fantasy baseball podcast that I have been working on for a while. So I'm really excited to get that launched for the 2023 season. I like making lemonade out of lemons. That's There we of go. Success. Yeah. Awesome. Well, no wonder you're on all these other podcasts. You just got to get your fix. You got to get behind the mic and get a, get keep keep that going and keep it fresh. So we're glad to have you here with us to continue with that. And like I said, we'll we got some news to talk about. We got some Cubs news, but we're gonna save that for a little bit later on. We're gonna start off, Kevin, though, with a trade. We haven't had a ton of trades this off season, but this is probably on the smaller side when it comes down to it. But it still happened, so we should probably talk about it. The Cleveland Guardians they traded their for- former former first rounder Will Benson to the Cincinnati Reds as the Reds continue to collect outfield reclamation projects or, or ones with uh, that might still have some potential and see what they can do in great American small park. But can you see Benson getting even any more playing time in Cincinnati than he might've gotten in Cleveland? Maybe, but probably not to start I, the strikeout rates in spite of the improvement he made in 2022 at the triple a level, when he made the move up to play 28 games at the major league level, his strike eight, strikeout rates went right back to above 30 percent where it's been throughout his entire minor league career dating back to 2016 he's almost 25 years old and has struck out at over a 30 percent rate all but for 61 games at high a in 2019 and then 401 plate appearances at triple a in 2022 that's probably what got him his 28 games at the major league level Only 61 plate appearances, so there was a lot of moving in and out of the lineup there. Only about two plate appearances per game that he appeared in. But the strikeout rate went right back up to over 30%. All of the projection systems have him for a strikeout rate of over 30%. So I don't see him getting into the lineup, even in Cincinnati, right off the bat. It's possible if he can get back to somewhere near that 22.7% strikeout rate he showed at AAA last season that we'll see him get another chance at the major league level. But it's really not something I'm very excited about at the moment. Yeah, that's fair. I think it's just we heard a lot about Will Benson losing possible playing time in Cleveland with the addition of Josh Bell moving Josh Naylor off the position and into the outfield or into the DH position as well. At first glance, you see this, oh, going to Cincinnati. But the thing is, we've had this conversation too many times already. I get get excited every time someone's going to Cincinnati. You can't get excited about all of them. Unfortunately, recently, I've come right back down after I went and looked at the players. Sarah, when you look at the Cleveland roster, do you see the Guardians making another move that fill any sort a gap that Benson might have left from his departure or do you just see the remaining roster eating up whatever small amount of playing time Benson might have gotten no I think the remaining roster takes care of it and actually I was just in a draft and hold where I have Miles Straw as one of my late round picks we're going to talk about Miles Straw in a little bit on this episode I think and about 
10 rounds later added George Valera to that because I wanted the backup for Miles Straw when Miles Straw and his 212 batty average inevitably hit the bench, even though he's currently projected for a full season of playing time. And so I really think that Cleveland's in a pretty nice position in terms of where they have minor league depth and who can come up to fill some of those roles. But I do think that if you're looking at some of those positions where somebody might be a little bit questionable, having somebody in that minor league system who's going to fill that role can be a nice way to make sure your roster has those options available for you, particularly if it's a situation like a draft and hold where you don't have any sort of waiver wire pickups later in the season. Yeah, George Valera just fits that bill of the guy we've been talking about for the I last <laughs> 12 years, I think. I think that's accurate when he's actually going to come up and make an impact. But that's just Cleveland's MO, though, right? So let's just hold on to these prospects until they're either a superstar or, all right, now it's too late. Will, Will Benson's just eating up a 40-man roster spot. We got to open that up because that did open up a 40-man roster spot for them. So they can either hold on to one of their other minor leaguers that needs to be moved onto that or sign a veteran that they could possibly trade at the deadline for a one-year deal that might still be on the market. So we'll see what they do there. But I like your uh, the strategy that revolved around your draft picks there for those. We had another signing, not for a free agent, Sarah, but in San Diego, they lock up you Darvish with an extension that should keep him in, in San Diego, I think through his age 41 season. We all know who you Darvish is at this point, but at this point, but does a, a signing like this to at a very established, elder, uh, still productive starting pitcher do anything for you as far as giving you any more or less confidence in them this year, knowing that the team is willing to pay and lock him up through such a through a, a lengthy contract again into his age 41 season? I love this for the San Diego Padres, and I even like that it's a little too long for when we think you Darvish is going to be at his peak. I read a quote from, I think it was Dennis Lynn on Twitter earlier today, where he said that the Padres take on this is when we have elite players, we are going to keep them in our system. And frankly, I wish more teams would do that. I've thought for a while now that the, the, unappreciated element of baseball like you go back to the money ball lessons like the money ball mm-hmm. lessons are not obp over average it's find the thing that other people aren't doing and zig while other people are zagging so that you can get value there the thing other people aren't doing is spend money and so the padres were like we will spend money we will take your <laughs> players who are really good and we will spend money on them and then maybe that will get us a championship and i love this for the city of san diego even if you darvish can't be a starter productively when he's 38 or 39 years old. The man has so many pitches. Does anybody really think that he can't channel his inner John Smoltz and become like some elite reliever late at the end of this deal? And if you get you Darvish as your closer for his age 40 and 41 season for $18 million a year, that is a steal. I love it for San Diego. I love it for you, Darvish. And I wish Jed Hoyer would take lessons from what they're doing <laughs> over there in San Diego because my kingdom for a single extension, just one, I just one extension, just a one. little one as a just treat. <laughs> I don't understand why more, more elite starting pitchers don't go this John Smoltz route. Like you just mentioned, I always, as a, as a Red Sox fan, I always thought Pedro should do this at the end of his career, even with the Mets, like even at the very tail end, just channel those two best pitches and just be close out 50 games in in your final season. It seems like more pitchers, more starting pitchers could do that at the tail end of their career, especially ones like you said, like Darvish who have 17 pitches at their, in their bag that they could pull out at any possible time or just channel two or three of them to the best of their ability. The most amazing thing when you Darvish was a cub that I ever saw a pitcher do Craig Kimbrell joins the Cubs while you Darvish is there. And within a week and a half, you Darvish has learned Craig Kimbrell's knuckle curve and throws it in a game. And he goes from having 12 pitches to 13 pitches. And they ask him about it. Like, Where did this come from? He's like, yeah, I talked to Craig and he like showed me and I like played around with it. And now I'm throwing it in games. And I was just like, that is savant. It's Energy like one of those pitcher. superhero powers that like when you get in contact with somebody with another power, you suck up their powers. Yeah, it's just. <laughs> so I love this for the mutant. Padres. I love saying. it for the city of San Diego. They deserve a World Series win. And since the Cubs can't bring themselves to truly try and win a World Series anymore, I, the Padres are one of my like three adopted teams that I there really want to win. You could definitely adopt worse for sure. Kevin, do you feel does this kind of a tr- uh, signing for a guy like Darvish move the needle for you at all, especially in a redraft league just for this season? Not really. I already 
liked you Darvish for this season. Got him in a couple of spots, not everywhere. He's in that area where I think a lot of people consider him. And if he happens to be there when you come up and he's available, I think he he's a fine choice. I agree with everything Sarah said. It's it, This is amazing that San Diego is doing this. And we all know for the most part, this is basically a three-year deal, but we're going to pay you for six years it's one of those but if they can do something like that with him and let him move to the bullpen later that that would be absolutely amazing but I don't think it really moves the needle at all this year I think he's I think he's mature enough that this isn't oh the sign the big deal avoid him type thing he was already in San Diego he's signed big deals before he's moved around before I don't think this affects him much at all but I still think he's a fine choice where he's going all right let's move to the complete opposite end of the spectrum Kevin we'll go over to Milwaukee when Aaron Ashby who already signed an extension (laughs) <laughs> last year in the middle of the season. He's expected to be brought along a little bit slower than I think many of us had hoped after being noticed with more shoulder fatigue, similar to what he was dealing with toward the end of 2021. With this news, the fact that they brought in guys like Wade Miley and have a pretty deep rotation as it is, is Ashby draftable? And if so, in what kind of format? For me, He's now more draftable than he was. For most people, especially those that have already drafted him, I'd be very concerned, depending on the format. But in some of these some of these leagues, I don't know if I could keep him on my roster in a limited bench spot league at this moment. For example, NFBC leagues with seven bench spots. I don't know how long you're holding on to him if you've already drafted him. I probably would not draft him in those leagues now. If you go to his page on the NFBC, it doesn't tell you what format these leagues were, but his ADP is 220-ish. His last three drafts, he's been picked 376, 311, 324. He is dropping like a rock, which means I've never been able to grab him in a DC Now he's coming down to the price, and if he continues to drop, I may end up with him in a couple of draft and hold leagues. I was not touching him at where he was being drafted before. So personally, I think he becomes more draftable in draft champions and other draft and hold formats. But to I think where your question was really leaning to in fab leagues right now with limited bench, I'm not going there. I am uh, su- very surprisingly, I went through my exposure list on NFBC. I actually forgot how many drafts I've even done, but it looks like I've completed six. No, that can't be true. That's just my highest percentage is six. Anyway, I only have one league that I've drafted. That after. surprises me. Yeah. Or, is Jordan in all of your leagues? No, Jordan's not in any of my leagues yet. So <laughs> yeah, that would have been, that would have been the common denominator, but it was our first listener league back in November. I was able to grab him. So we will see how quickly I am able to drop him in the first week of fab. That's a, again, the beauty of drafting a fab league in November. You might end up rotating out over 33% of your roster, but you can do that. You can still do that and find talent in the first week. Sarah, besides what's your take on Ashby? And then also with him, with knowing that Ashby is not even an option for the rotation, at least in the early goings of the 2022 season. And who knows how long after that is this is elevate anybody else in that rotation, at least any of the options that Milwaukee might have in your eyes. So, I love Ashby's stuff and I love Milwaukee's pitching development generally. I think they are very good at developing pitching that is elite. I get to watch it all the time at Wrigley Field and I'm Mm -hmm. always impressed. Ashby is frustrating because he has elite stuff and not elite results, which is a really weird thing to watch as a baseball fan. I think that Ashby is currently an NL only draft and hold type of situation and a guy that I am watching for on the waiver wire when and if he is healthy and when and if Wade Miley is not because I I have Wade Miley I can't remember if it's a draft and hold situation or if it's another situation but I picked him up after the Brewers picked him up and I like Wade Miley a lot I think that he is a very effective pitcher I think the pitch clock plays to his strengths but he struggled to stay healthy and and I watched him do that with the Cubs last year I forget how many innings he threw last year but I want to say it was like in the 50 to 60 range so at some point Ashby is going to get a shot if he's healthy to piggyback on that Wade Miley situation and the question is just which one of them stays healthy long enough and is effective long enough to hold that spot. 
I like I would love nothing more than to see Ashby just piggyback with another pitcher. Like it doesn't have to be an opener situation. If they just do the whole first four innings, next four innings, and Ashby is the next four innings guy, I'd be perfectly fine with that. The more opportunities for wins, if you're playing with wins still in your leagues, and he can still rack up anywhere between six and 10 strikeouts in only four innings, as long as his stuff is on, knowing that he's only going to go that many innings, that could play up a little bit more. I don't, this is also me just thinking, I don't think enough teams do this with you know with their guys that aren't quite ready to go five or six innings on a regular basis if you have multiple guys that you still want to keep them stretched out why not have them go off of each other so just an idea brewers just throwing that out there it would really help me out i appreciate it all right we finally got to the cubs news big news sarah the <laughs> commence giant eye roll now we got michael fulmer being the newest member of the chicago cubs bullpen is this a closer option that everybody should be jumping at pick 150 now in, in their drafts first of all love something as much as jed hoyer loves non-interesting guys who are slightly better than the guys who are currently on the Already roster the but roster. beyond that the, I went to roster resource before this when they added when Fulmer got added, and there are currently four guys listed as closers for the Chicago Cubs: Brandon Hughes, Adbert Alzali, Michael Fulmer now, Brad Boxberger. But by my count, there are at least three other guys that people should keep their eye on for saves in the Chicago system. One is Jeremiah Estrada, who has a live arm. Love him. I love everything about him. Rowan Wick is the guy who has the most saves out of that crew, who is still left from the 2022 team. And then Cody Hoyer, who everyone who has forgotten was part of the return for Craig Kimbrell and had surgery last year and should be back May or June. And I actually think he might be the best arm in that system. Oh, and don't forget, they picked up Merriweather too. And Merriweather Mm -hmm. is a live arm as well. It is a situation. It is the most closer by committee situation in all of baseball. And you could convince yourself easily that one of these guys has the job or that it's like an Alzali Hughes platoon or that it's like you could convince yourself of all sorts of things. <laughs> I would stay far away from the Cubs bullpen if I needed saves. We had this, I'm not having the same conversation, Kevin, every single week. Okay. <laughs> which, which bullpen is more chaotic, Philadelphia, Miami, Chicago. There's, there, there are plenty of options for that, Sarah. So I, I'm glad to see that another team has entered the fray into the conversation of most chaotic, chaotic bullpen. I'm just happy that my Red Sox have one thing now that they're not part of because they had been for the last couple of years. All right, I'm, I'm glad I was able to just like this, dedicate the very, very important Cubs news to you, Sarah, and I'm glad you're able to provide us with that. So we'll go into our last piece of news here. Kevin, David Peralta, he signs the newest outfielder to actually sign with the Dodgers. The Dodgers actually signed an outfielder, something we were expecting them to do all offseason, especially after non-tendering Cody Bellinger. He joins the likes of the outfielders that are already on the roster of Chris Taylor, obviously Mookie Betts, Trace Thompson. And James Outman, is there anything we really should be keeping an eye out for with Peralta being in in the Dodgers? And how does this really affect the playing time with everybody else that was already there? No, I like this move. Don't think he could have landed many better spots. He might have got more playing time going to bad team, quote unquote, bad team going with the Dodgers. He's probably strong side of the platoon in, in left field. I agree with where roster resource has him right now. And I think that's a fine spot for him. Get close to 500 plate appearances, double digit home runs. We talked about him a little bit last week in that aspect when we were talking about late round power. And I think this is a fine spot for him. As far as the rest of the Dodgers lineup goes, I don't think this affects it much. He's not going to play center. So I think Trace Thompson is still who we talked about last week. And I think is still for now the center fielder. So I continue to have peaked interest in Trace Thompson after poo-pooing him earlier in the offseason. The closer and closer we get to opening day and then not signing another center fielder. And Chris Taylor's going to move around. He probably does platoon with David Peralta in left field and move around the infield as well as needed. We, they got some guys with the injury history, so... I don't see a whole big waterfall effect from this signing, but I think it's a nice place for Peralta to land for those that have been drafting him late in drafting holds leagues once again. 
Yeah, your words last week had definitely pushed me to uh, take a chance on Trace Thompson as I grabbed him in our latest listener league that just finished up earlier today. I think I grabbed him in round 26, 12-teamer. Again, Fab League, love it. See how that works out throughout the uh, spring training. If it looks like they're going to go with Outman more often than not, Thompson goes, he gets kicked, he gets the boot. But with all the potential we talked about last week with our power category, he has that in him. So I'm glad to hear you not think that this will really affect how much playing time. Now, production is spring training. That may (laughs) dictate the playing time. So something that we need to keep an eye on. Which Um, when this, when, as this episode drops on Sunday, spring training starts this week as we are talking to people as if it is Sunday. That is amazing. That is amazing. uh, You're in Hawaii. There are no games in Hawaii. You're not making any trips to Arizona or Florida, are you? Unfortunately, no. I had talked with a buddy about it uh, that that lives in Texas about trying to hit some of the Arizona games. Not going to happen this year. Sarah, you're going to Florida during spring training, if I'm not mistaken, right? I am headed to Miami for the WBC in spring training from March 8th to the 14th. And I cannot tell you. So it was really tough to decide which WBC wheel I wanted to see more of the Mexico, U.S., Canada wheel or Mm -hmm. the Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, Venezuela, man. That was I am looking forward to watching the DR and PR face off. Those two teams are ridiculous. I those are all star teams. Both of them are all star teams and they're going to play each other and it is going to be for national pride. And I am just like I am so beyond over the moon for all of it. Can I just say one thing about the Dodgers outfield while we're taking the turn to that? (laughs) Do not forget that the Dodgers have a minor league deal with Jason Hayward, who can play a passable defense in center field. And if the Dodgers are better at fixing swings than the Cubs are, which I would bet money the Dodgers are better at fixing swings than the Cubs are, Jason Hayward could be a sneaky good deal for the Dodgers. I am not telling anyone to go draft Jason Hayward. I am really just reminding people that he is on the depth chart there somewhere. And if he comes out in training and looks like he has been fixed, I I would get on that. Nobody would bat an eye. Yes. Nobody would actually be surprised to see that, as you mentioned, with the Dodgers of all places. But yeah, I also like the caveat that you're saying, please, I'm not telling you to draft him. Just watch. All I'm saying (laughs) is that the Cubs are trying to fix Cody Bellinger and the Dodgers are trying to fix Jason Hayward. And I believe in one one works. much more than the other. Which one has so the better odds of actually? How happening? crazy is that if Jason Hayward has a better 2023 than Cody Bellinger? Ooh, put it on the board. That would Does be anyone here think that could not happen? Like, I think that's going to happen. It would be the most Cubs thing ever. <laughs> oh, man. this Is this the first World Baseball Classic that you've been to, or you've been to any of the ones in the past? This is my first World Baseball Classic. It's also my first spring training. So I'm pretty oh, stoked right. about both of awesome. those. Yeah. Nice. I, uh, I had the pleasure when. Living in the Bay Area when, in 2013, when they had the the semifinals and finals at what was then AT and T Park in San Francisco, so I got witness Dominican Republic versus Puerto Rico. Obviously, very different rosters back then, but that was the finals. And yes, like you said, that uh, it was quite the spectacle as far as talent on the field, everything involved in that whole. So if anybody has the opportunity still to go to any of the games, I highly recommend it. It's one of those once in a lifetime opportunities type of things because they don't, they only play in certain areas. It's like the Super Bowl only plays in certain stadiums at any given time. And if you don't get a chance to see it, you might need another 15, 20 years before it comes back. So if you have the chance, make sure you uh, take that opportunity. I'm looking forward to it mostly because I, one of my least favorite players in all of baseball was Yadier Molina. Cause I'm a Cubs fan and I watched Yadier Molina do damage to the Cubs for a really long time. <laughs> The last World Baseball Classic, I liked Yadier Molina. Puerto Rico Yadier Molina was fun. Him and Javi oh, Baez yeah. and all the bleached hair and like he was like trash talking people and Javi's trash talking people and Francisco Lindor's out there trash talking with people. I, I, this was great. Like I am so here for all of this. So a- anything that could make me like Yadi for even a few weeks there is pretty go. powerful and I'm excited to see it in person. Perfect. All right, we are done with our news. We got to talk about some strategy revolving around those speed categories I mentioned earlier, those runs, those stolen bases that are so hard to come by in every year's draft. Before we get into all that, though, we do have to take a quick break. All right, we are back. You are still listening to On The Wire. I am Adam Howe, joined as always by Kevin Hastings, and we are lucky to be joined by Sarah Sanchez. And we are talking speed. We are talking runs. We are talking stolen bases. And... 
I'm going to get your guys' overall takes, kind of the 30,000 foot idea of drafting speed throughout your draft, whether it's at the beginning, at the middle, at the end. Sarah, what, what are your kind of overall thoughts on how important the speed categories are going to be as a target going into 2023 drafts? So I'm actually prioritizing power over speed for the first time in multiple seasons for two reasons. One, I think that the larger bases, that is a much bigger impact than people think it's going to be on the running game. Think of all of the times somebody is barely out at second. All of the times somebody is barely out at third. Like those become stolen bases, which means that the players who could have stolen those bases are going to get the green light more often. I think that teams will figure out pretty quickly that there, there are some marginal guys who they weren't letting run before because we all know that most major league teams have been dictating who can run based on their percentage outcomes that they are actually going to be able to steal this base or not. And those outcomes are going to change based on those rules. But it's not just the size of the bags. It's also the pitcher being able to throw over and hold runners on and catchers needing to be able to throw runners out. And one of the impacts of this rule change that I think people haven't thought about as much is that a lot of catchers are not trained at the moment to control the running game because they're trained to frame pitches. The most valuable thing a catcher can do is steal all of those strikes. And those two things are directly contradictory to each other. Your ability to hold the pitch and your ability to pop up and throw the runner out are diametrically opposed. It's one of the reasons that Wilson Contreras' framing numbers are all over the place because he likes to throw guys out all the time and he had to control the running game when he was John Lester's personal catcher and that was those two things are diametrically opposed. I watched it frequently at Wrigley Field. And so I'm very I am my hunch is that stolen bases are going to jump and we have a situation where home runs are not very plentiful right now, particularly in the early months. We saw it last year with the humidors, we saw it with the weather there were a lot of guys who had power outages that were almost inexplicable in April and May. The number of guys you can count on for 20 home runs is bleak right now. And I am prioritizing power over speed. I think that means that some of the guys who have been your stolen base specialists who you would put up with on your roster while they were hitting 210 because they were going to steal you 25 or 30 bags are way less valuable than they used to be. And I also think that it means that some of those guys who hit you 30 home runs while they're hitting 230, those guys are more valuable. And the last thing I'll say here, I know I just said a lot, is that I think that those power hitters are going to be helped a lot by the shift rules. Because if you sell out for poolside power right now, the downside of that was that you were going to hit into the shift if you hit a line drive instead of a home run. And that's not true anymore, which is probably worth 15 or 20 batting average points for a Kyle Schwarber or an Anthony Rizzo or those guys who get shifted all of the time. Yeah. So I think a lot of people forget. And I think on the surface, a lot of people think about the shift as you have one less infielder on the right side of the infield, but really a lot of the times they're either a shallow outfielder in the grass still on the right side of the infield, but it's not really eating up. It's still eating up ground balls. Sure. That go through the hole, but it's really eating up those line drives like the, like you're talking about that are just going to get over the infield's head. Kevin, we talked about it last week with uh, whether you're, how you're targeting power. Is, are you thinking with the dead and ball, with the rule changes with speed, is power going to be more important or is speed still the thing that you have to get early on in your drafts or more spreading out? And I say speed, and I'm saying that on purpose. We talk about this in season. Speed isn't just stolen bases. Speed is runs. Runs, I feel, is the whip of hitting categories. It's just that category people forget about. And they're like, oh, they'll come. And But you know what? It's still worth as much as a home run category in a five by five league. How are you prioritizing your speed throughout It's really interesting. And uh, as we'll talk about as we go along here, it depends on what you do early, what you have to do later. I think stolen base numbers are going up significantly. I, the issue is the guys that don't steal at all, they're going to go up the same percentage as everybody else. And a percentage of zero is zero. So those guys become less appealing to me. And we talked last week about how many home runs does a guy have to hit with no speed before we're interested. And we, Pete Alonzo's name kept coming up. And of course, he hits enough home runs that we can build teams around him and get speed other places for getting that much power. 
but some of these other players, if you steal zero bases, you are going to have to drop a lot in drafts or be absolutely outstanding in all of the other categories for me to be interested unless you are unless it's somebody like Pete Alonso and after the first couple of rounds those guys are gone right let me give you a Pete Alonso ish guy who ran last year Kyle Schwarber hit 46 home runs and stole 10 bases without right. the rules changes so Kyle right. Schwarber is a dude who has told us with his feet that he's willing to run when he sees the opportunity. And one of the one of my favorite things about Kyle Schwarber is there to prove you wrong about whatever you think about him. So <laughs> I think in 2018, he led the league in outfield assists or was tied for the league in outfield assists or something. It was just because everybody thought his defense is bad, but they forgot that was his range, not his arm. And so he just kept throwing dudes out at second. It was really fun to watch as a Cubs fan. He did the same thing last year for the Phillies stealing bases because people forgot that Kyle Schwarber can run. Like he's not incapable of running if you ignore him. Does that dude steal 10 bags again? Does he steal 15? If you get 15 stolen bases and 40 plus home runs from Kyle Schwarber, why would you take like Pete? I would take Kyle Schwarber over Pete Alonso for that. I know there's a positional difference there, whatever, but like, I'd rather have Schwarber in that instance. In the previous two seasons, Kyle Schwarber stole one base in each of those two seasons. We joked about it last week. Does Pete Alonso go to the Mets and say, Hey, with these new rules, I, I want to this. take off once in a while, right? <laughs> I want in on this. That Why not? That looks like fun. <laughs> yeah, especially when we get to, to later rounds. No speed is almost a deal breaker, I think, because the total number we need is going to go up. We know the overall number of stolen bases is going to go up. I saw somebody tweet a month or so ago that says, we don't even know stolen bases are going to go up. Yes, we do. We know they're going up. We just don't know exactly where. And by who and how often, how much, that's what we don't know. But they are going up. I want at least some stolen bases for almost from almost everybody on my roster. And I think this brings, I, this is where I'll push back against Sarah a little bit here. I think this brings somebody like Asturias Ruiz more into play for me, especially if I have a Pete Alonzo early or something. I think... As long as I feel like I do have enough power and batting average in my lineup, I'm going to be pretty happy having someone like that in my lineup as well. Especially when outfield is as shallow as it is, especially in 15 team leagues with five starting outfielders, there's a whole bunch of people going to be started in fantasy baseball leagues that we're going to be like, eh, put a rabbit out there. See if you can get something out of them. See, can I, I, can I, I got to ask you a comp question. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Esther A. Ruiz, I hear you. I understand why you like him. Here's a dude who is going one pick before him that I like more because of what we just talked about. Jorge Soler. Jorge Soler is 40 home run power and also outfield eligible. He's going 290. Estuary Ruiz is going 291. That is a choice that you could really be forced to make in a draft. And if I am forced to make that draft decision, this year, I think I pick Jorge Soler over Estuary Ruiz because I need those 40 home runs more than I need the stolen bases I'm getting from Ruiz. You might. Here's the thing. That's the pushback. You might need it and you might not. True. So I That's was true. in that I was in that situation three days ago and I chose Estuary Ruiz. And the most the, the main reason I did was I did exactly what you said, Sarah, and I focused 100% of my early drafting on power. I have Pete Alonso. I have Nolan Arenado and I have Kyle Schwarber. And like those three are my, those are my dudes that are holding everything together at the top of my draft. So I did not look at speed at all. So I grabbed your boy, Nico Horner later on in the draft, but I also grabbed Ruiz, S. Ruiz as who will end up being a bench bat for me in this format, 12 teamer that I totally plan on spot starting when I feel as though he's in a situation where he's going to get more opportunity to steal in matchups against pitchers who don't hold runners well, who have high tempos going into this year and are going to have a harder time holding those runners, catchers who have a history of bat playing those matchups. But I needed those stolen bases. I needed a guy that I could almost guarantee that if I throw him in a seven game week with at least one or two decent matchups as far as stolen bases go, he can get on base enough to steal me two bases in a week. 
And that's all you need. Kevin and I talk about this all, <laughs> all year throughout the year. If you can fab and stream stolen bases, if you get a guy to steal you one base a week and you rotate that throughout the season, you that's a guy who steals 26 bases. If, would you draft somebody on a regular basis who can get you 26 steals? Yeah, m- that guy is going to get drafted in most drafts. So that was the decision I made in that realm. I agree. If I need the power, yeah. So there's the obvious choice of those two. It really depends on what you ended up doing throughout the course of your of your draft. Because Ruiz isn't going to give you anything else. At least Solaire, you'd think with the home runs, can still add on to the other can- counting categories. Ruiz is going to be at the bottom of that Oakland A's lineup. He obviously has his own issues as far as getting on base. And so he is a one-trick pony as of right now. We'll see if that changes throughout the course of the season. So I will defer to your Soler pick for that reason. But I think there are going to be situations in which Ruiz is the choice that you make based on the roster construction you've made. No, you're totally right. Depending on how you built prior to that, like you already have, you already banked your 90, 110 <laughs> home runs. Like you're probably good investing in steals instead. But I do think it's interesting because I don't remember the last time we had a season where that comp of Ruiz mm-hmm. and Soler back to back is such a pivot point, right? Do you need home runs? Do you need steals? And which of these things is more valuable? I think for the last, I don't even know how many, how long it's been that the answer to that was always steals. Everybody needed. Look what Miles Straw was doing last yeah. year, as far as going in drafts. He was going anywhere between the sixth and ninth round, and everybody and for the knew first what- couple of months he was paying off huge. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he waited long enough yeah. <laughs> to get there. Yeah, steals have been such a priority over the last couple of years until the ball got dead ended, and everybody's complaining as of last year. Oh, I didn't prioritize power enough. Oh, shocker! Because that's all anybody was talking about. It's like, how are you going to get your steals? How are you going to get your speed? We'll see how like you said, like you guys have been talking about what these new rules, the actual effect. Watch spring training. People talk about how there's so much noise in spring training. I, some people say, I don't even watch spring training because none of it matters as far as stats go. There are certain things that do matter. People always say K minus walk rate. That's something you want to look at. Stolen. What teams do with stolen bases has usually trickled into April. I'll just say that it might not go all year round, but the tendencies that teams have in spring training tend to trickle into April and they have the same kind of tendency. So you got a team running a lot more, trying to take advantage of these new rules or at least test out the bases, then they may well do that into April as well, whether it's with those same players or at least as a team, especially with a couple of new managers out there, you want to see what their tendencies are going to be. It's something to keep an eye out that will trickle into the regular season. Sarah, what positions when you're looking for speed, do you have a position that you're hoping to get your speed from, or it's because it's harder to get that speed from say your corner infielder. If you find a corner infielder that can gift you 10 to 20 stolen bases, is that something that you prioritize or are you just getting speed wherever you can get speed from? I do love a catcher who will get you steals. I have a soft spot for JT Romito. I have a soft spot for Dalton Varsho. I don't bump them like a ton. Like I'm mm-hmm. not trying to get them ahead of their ADP, but if I happen to be in a position in a draft room where they're going to fall to me and it's a good value, like I, I'm happy to take a catcher who will run there. I will also point out that one catcher who runs probably too much, we, he toot bland a lot last year. If you're not familiar with the acronym toot bland, it stands for thrown out on the base pass like a nincompoop. Wilson <laughs> Contreras likes to run more than he should. And Wilson Contreras would have been safe a lot more with the new stolen base rules in 2023. So I, I have no idea what the Cardinals are going to do as, a, as an organization in terms of running philosophy. I know the Cubs are willing to run a lot. Their running philosophy is currently their running coach is basically Mike Napoli, which look, don't get me started on Mike Nap- Napoli being in charge of when you run or not, but they run way too much and they get thrown out on the base pass a lot as a result. But I think that will pay off for them in 2023. The Cubs are a team that I would look to, to run. In fact, Nico Horner said as much at CubsCon. He said, the Cubs are going to, we're going to keep running. And I was like, oh, yay, here we go again. So I think there are some catchers who are willing to run. I would not be surprised to see some of them try it more. I don't really look for steals out of first base. I will look for guys who steal at third base. It's one of the things that I like to differentiate a third baseman on whether or not they'll steal. And obviously outfield and middle infield is the spot to really get those positions. But I tend to look at team dynamics ahead of position dynamics there because look, man, the A's are going to run. They have nothing to lose. They like it and they'll steal some bags because that's how they're going to score runs. And frankly, the Cubs were the same team last year. (laughs) 
Yeah, Oakland will let anybody run as well. Last year, like they didn't have anybody attempt a stolen base with a sprint speed over 28.7. St. Louis, on the other hand, like they really, re- at least last year, they really relied on their speedsters to get the majority or at least over a third of their stolen base attempts on the base pass, but plenty of middle tier speed guys as well. So that's that part that's interesting to me. So when you talk about team dynamics, it's like who are they actually allowing to run? And then maybe is that going to impact the players that get more opportunity next year? If like they were already willing to let, you know, quote, slow players run on the base pass. Does that mean that team is going to run even more because they were already letting slow people run? You might as well let them run even more on the base pass. So something something to keep eye on as far as who are you letting run? Boston didn't run at all last year. <laughs> I talked about this last like last week or the week before. The it top was last three, week because of was, Mondesi. Yes, yeah. that's right because it was Mondesi. Like the only guys that got any stolen bases last year were Trevor Story, Xander Bogarts, and Jaron Duran. They're all off the team. And so Montessi is the only guy on there with any speed talent. You got to assume that they're still going to let him run for other other reasons besides the fact that he's just fast. But they don't rely on anybody else to run at least to any kind of degree. So keeping eye on, I I like your comment about team dynamic is going to be important there as well as volume as well. So you got to get on base to steal bases. And that's the one thing Oakland's probably got against them going into the season. You actually have to get on base to do that first. Are you, I don't want to word this because we already talked about it. Are you looking to get your speed for any particular either position or are you targeting the speed, both the runs category and the stolen base category early in the draft, middle of the draft? Are you spreading it out like what we've done in the past? I don't care where it comes from or when. As long as I end up with it at the end, I'm good. However, Will Garofalo, when he was with us a few episodes back, mentioned how nice it is if you have Jose Ramirez at third base and JT Rio Milto at catcher. catcher. (laughs) And I did that in one of our listener leagues, the one listener league where I had the first overall pick. I took J Ram and then got JT Real Muto. And it is comforting as you go throughout your draft from then <laughs> on. You have 30 to 40 minimum stolen bases in the bank that no one else is going to get for the most part from those positions. One or two guys, Var shows out there, a couple other people. You have those bags and no one else is going to get those. It makes it really nice the rest of the way through the draft, but it. That's a hard combo to pull off. That's true. Because it is a little bit a little bit easier to get from their middle infield, from some of your outfield spots as well, knowing that you were able to bank that in those positions that don't, they don't usually exist, at least as readily, you don't have to worry about, because whoever you draft at the middle infield positions is going to get you something. More than likely. There's a couple Everybody of guys out there. Yep. Yeah, I was gonna yeah. say, unless you're draft, <laughs> drafting Max Muncy or Yeah, there are guys you can avoid for that reason. Like Kevin, zero percent of zero is still zero. And so maybe you're still avoiding those just so you can get five. But as a percentage of all of those players, a high percentage of them are gonna get you at least a handful. So you can usually throw a dart and you probably pop one of the balloons. All right. I think we hit on how you wanna target your draft throughout the first, you know. 20, 25 rounds. Let's talk about a couple players that we may be targeting at the very end of drafts, especially in a 12 teamer. These are guys that may even be available on the wire if you've already drafted one. Some guys that you might want to just le- let stay on the wire and you can watch them and then fab them in the first week. Or you want to take that roll that dice now in a draft, pick them up in your 29th, 30th round. If you're Light on speed, you need to take a risk, take a chance on speed and see what they're going to do with the spring training, what they're going to see with the new rules, et cetera, et cetera. And we're going to get into some of those player discussion after this quick break. All right, back. Let's get right into it. We guys, we're, I gave you homework assignment as Kevin, as we talked about last week, we are looking at players that have an ADP of at least 325 or later in the last month's worth of online championships. So from my count, there's been 14 completed online championships. These are 12 teamers on the NFBC platform. So of course, you got your five outfielders, you got your middle, you got your corner, you got your seven bench spots. And so we, I asked you guys for a corner, a middle infielder, and an outfielder player that will specifically be helping you in the speed categories. Again, I don't want, I'm hoping 
As you're looking at this, you're not only thinking about stolen bases. Runs are are important as well. These are targets you got to keep an eye out for. And so, Sarah, as the guest, I'm going to let you lead it off with whatever position you want to talk about first. Who might be your kind of last pick if you want to take a Hail Mary on some speed in a draft or somebody you'll be watching to see if they're available on the wire in your first half period? Oh, awesome. You're going to let me pick. I was worried I was going to have to start with corner infield, which is clearly like the weakest part of all this. I'll start with the outfield. I and mean, there's two guys here that I'm really interested in that I am keeping an eye on, both because of the playing time that they are going to have. And I think they're going to run and I think they're going to be in the lineup every day, which means it's going to help them with the run situation. The first guy that I'm going to talk about is Miles Straw, who I think he has that job right now. He's not going to lose it. He has that contract and Cleveland has shown a willingness to play him. He's currently going at Pick 448, he's a 20-plus steals guy. And I think that as long as his defense plays and he's not actively hurting the team, I think that Miles Straw is going to get a chance to play. They are committed to paying him that money. Obviously, if he got hurt or something, there are some other guys who could come up. But I think Miles Straw is a pretty nice 20-plus steals guy who is going to be in the lineup almost every day, late, late, late in drafts. And then the second guy there that I re- that I like even more at pick 358 is TJ Friedel. For the Reds, and he's one of the reasons that when we were talking about the Benson trade earlier, I was, I think Friedel has that job on lock. And Friedel is a power speed combo guy. So you're looking at getting some home runs there as well. I watched him play at Wrigley Field last year, and I was pretty impressed. And he is hitting low in the lineup for the Reds. He doesn't have a lot of pressure for his job. I think that if anyone's coming for a job in the Reds outfield, they're coming for Nick Senzel and his injury history. And so Friedel is a dude who is currently projected for 10 plus bags, but I think he could do more. He's shown an ability and willingness to run in the minors and I would keep an eye on him late in drafts. Man, I love and hate TJ Fredel only because we talked about him last year. I touted him as a stolen base pick that you should be grabbing. And I grabbed him in a bunch of places and then he got sent down that sun. Like, I feel like he got sent down that Sunday night after February. I don't know how that's possible, but I'm pretty sure that's what happened. <laughs> but and he so, came up in September and was great for you. If no, you held oh no, on to him. No, by then I dropped him again. <laughs> but by then I didn't get to reap any of that. So yeah, I was a couple weeks early, but the advice was solid. That's what you're saying. I appreciate that. No, Frito's a good, is a great pick there. I was just going to check. Is he a guy though that's being at 358? Is that an accurate 358 where he's being drafted in all of these drafts at an ADP of 358? Because a lot of these guys we're going to talk about have not been drafted in many. uh, Four out of 14. How many? Of the OCs. Four out of 14 OCs. The range on Friedel is wild. So Friedel yeah. goes from anywhere between 264 to 624. Yep. That, um, that is quite the range. Yeah. And the OCs. Oh. Yeah. I clearly had a filter off there when I was looking on the page that I was just looking yeah, at. Yeah. No, 301 that, to 357. It's weird, but yeah, because he's only been drafted in those five. And so the ADP is always off when you do these filters and they haven't been drafted in 100% of these leagues. Like everybody I looked, I'm like, that's weird. How come the ADP is at 370? But he's only been drafted in one pit, one ra- draft at 328. And obviously, there's a wait for how many times you've been uh, picked. So you got to look at that with a little bit of a grain of salt. To so actually look at those min max picks, I'm glad you, you brought up that range as well. That's really important. Knowing the format in which you are drafting these types of guys. Who got TJ Friedel at 600 and something? I'm sure obviously it was in a DC, but man, congratulations. I Hopefully congratulations on that. That'll work out. That should work out. I would love you. I'm going to stick with outfield only because I would like to have your guys' take on the two Texas outfielders that have some speed here that, I, that I'm looking at. That's Leotis Tavares. It's only been drafted one time at pick 351 in the last month's worth of OCs versus Bubba Thompson. I have a couple of drafts that I've grabbed Bubba Thompson so far. I've not had Tavares. I have historically been more of a fan of Tavares, but I think in my early drafting, I got a little too antsy pantsy with the Thompson after what he was able to do at the end of last season, not only for me, but for a whole lot of people. He's only been drafted in three of the last 14 OCs as well, between 274 and 310. And so he he qualified for this only because of the weight and he hadn't been drafted in that many drafts, even though where he has been drafted before pick 325. Kevin, do you have a take on which one of these guys? I know you have a sh- you know you have some exposure to Bubba Thompson as well. I don't know if you have any Tavares, but both of these guys came up with stellar marks as far as base running aggressiveness goes with Thompson 
getting the 21 steals. Tavares was 16, or sorry, not 21, 21 attempts. And Tavares running 16 times as well, both above average as far as how often they run when they are able to. Do you have a preference on these two now that draft season has extended into February? I prefer Bubba Thompson. And I know I'm wrong. That's horrible. That's a horrible <laughs> place to be because I think the Rangers are going to give Tavares more playing time, at least to start the season. Bubba Thompson's not a 265 hitter, like he or whatever he ended up hitting at the end of the year. For but his first few weeks, he was hitting close to 300, and he's not. I think to I think the Rangers want Tavares to work out. Then they care if Bubba Thompson works out if that makes sense both of them were high highly rated prospects within their organization at a time but I think they really want Tavares to be their center fielder I think he's going to get some of that run Bubba Thompson I believe will be on the opening day roster I think he'll get some playing time I think he's going to be the fourth outfielder here and hopefully get enough playing time to be worthwhile in the DCs and the gladiator drafts where I even drafted Bubba Thompson in a gladiator. So I need some playing time out of him, but I think they're going to give Tavares more playing time, at least to start the season. We'll have to see how that works out. Either one of these guys, the one playing you, it is we want on our rosters. They're going to steal bases. Yeah. And if you are desperate at a point, these guys are probably going to be available, especially these 12 teamers. You could get them both if you're drafting today and then, Work it out at the in the first fab period after spring training or even the second fab period if you want to see what the first week weekend of games turns out for them. My only concern, obviously, you got to have concern when somebody just stop. They're continuing to run, but they're not being successful. This could with the new rules and the bases and whatnot that could work in Tavares's favor. His success rate definitely took a dip in 2022, but they still let him run. So that is that is a positive sign that they might continue to do that again next year. Sarah, to your point earlier in the show, these he very well. And I didn't watch all the video of all the times he got caught, <laughs> but I'm venturing to guess at least a handful of them might have just been like the ball came in just a second earlier. Or if the bases would, I don't know, maybe just like he's a guy I can see getting thrown out by coming off the bag as well, which the bigger bases may help a little bit. True. Yeah, you get stretch that foot a little bit longer as well. So a lot of options there as well. Of course, I want to give honorable mention also to Akil Badu in Detroit. And I know, Sarah, you had you had him as your second name here as well. So I'm going to let you take the lead on Badu. But the, not to mention the fact that the man runs, but the dimensions in Detroit are going to change a little bit. And that could just help him specifically as well. Man, Akil Badu is not being drafted in OCs right now. Like, he doesn't even appear on the list. And he runs, but he also has power. We saw it when he came up, and he is so young. And it's not like Detroit has a ton of people who are pushing Akil Badu for playing time right now. He currently projects as the strong side of a platoon. But I really think that there's 15, 15, 20, 20 upside if he gets hot and figures it out. And there's no reason to believe that a 24-year-old can't make adjustments and try to figure it out. So I think Akil Badu, you could do worse than spending your last draft picked on Akil Badu and seeing what happens and giving it two weeks to see if maybe he's got something going there. Because these some of these teams that are bottom feeders in their division, that is where you can find some guys that are going to get playing time and going to get run. And they may not get the same number of runs that somebody on the Braves is going to get. You're not going to have an 80, 90 run ceiling with them, but they might get 60 or 70. They're going to get, they're going to get more than the other guys that you could draft in a platoon in round 24. So I like Kiel Badu a lot and he's somebody I'm keeping an eye on late in drafts. And I like him because I like the skills more than I like the skills of the other guys we're talking about. I like the skills more than I like the skills of a Miles Dry. I like the skills more than I like the skills of a Bubba Thompson. If a Kiel Badu figures it out, Detroit's going to let him just go with it. Yeah, Badu, again, also ran plenty last year in his the limited time that he did that played, putting up 225 plate appearances, but he ran more than five times as much as your average average player. And again, just like Tavares, 60% success rate might have been a big red flag, but with the rule changes, that very well may be a big green flag to see if he'll continue to run at the same rate, and then that success rate goes up, and all those attempts become successes. So something to keep an eye out for as well. Kevin, I'm assuming that you went the route, which I appreciate, and then correct me if I'm wrong, maybe you're planning on keeping them all year round. 
but we talk a lot about this exercise being, hey, these are guys that you may not want on your roster past week four at the latest. I'm assuming that's the direction you went here with your outfield pick and you want him now just because you know he's healthy. At least you assume he's healthy. He said as much. Talk to me about Aaron Hicks. Yeah, there's old and boring, and then there's old and boring, and the fans of his own team can't stand the fact that he's still on the roster. (laughs) Holy cow. But he stole 10 bases in 2022. That leads me to the health that you brought up. He probably feeling pretty good. Now with these rules changes, yeah, he's 33 years old, but that, that little bit that we're losing, I think the rules, that's where I'm going with these rules changes on a lot of guys. These guys in their low 30s that steal 10 to 15 bases that we would say, ooh, we probably got to figure them for seven or eight. I'm not necessarily saying they're going to go up, but I'm figuring they're not going to drop because I, I, I is what I, where I'm going with some of the guys in this age range. And the Yankees have flat out told us right now he is their starting left fielder. He's going to be out there every day, right? Probably no, towards the bottom day. of the lineup, but <laughs> he is the left fielder for the New York Yankees. Like you said, four weeks in, he might be replaced, but to start out the season, he's going to be there in that lineup. The runs will be there. So a handful of stolen bases. So yeah, he is old and boring, but he's a guy that I think can give us some value, especially in OBP leagues. Walk rate is the only thing on his stat page that sticks out as a positive. <laughs> so OBP leagues, he's much better than the batting average leagues. But for where he's going, he's going to be available on your waiver wire. So if you're getting crushed like right away early in the season in stolen bases and you need a handful and they have a full week, grab him and put him in your lineup. It He's going to be one of those types of players and he'll probably be available throughout the season if and when you need him, at least until the Yankees go a different direction. Yeah. Or his knees go in a different direction. <laughs> um, yeah. I, any. He, the Yankees have an offense to like in the lieu of, of Houston. If you can get a piece of it, you can probably get in some extra accounting stats. We're looking at runs. If he can continue to get on base, which is like the only thing he's been able to really do when he's healthy, he'll have a good possibility of scoring runs from everybody else around him, knocking them in. So he just, as long as his knees hold up and, or his back or whatever else it is that's ailing him, he can actually make it away all the way around the bases. He could knock in a couple of runs for you before you have to stream him out for somebody else. All right, Sarah, I'm going to make you talk about corner infield now. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to let you lead it off just so we can get that out of the way. That way we can move on and we can just, but it is important. Stolen bases can come from anywhere. We just talked about that. We don't care where they come from as long as they come from somewhere. And you know what? There are some corners out there that will lead off from time and time again that have good on-base percentages and can get knocked in and score some runs for you. So if there's somebody out there that fits the bill or you can cheat like I did and pick somebody who's multi-positional eligible that happens to also be eligible at third base, then that fits, fits as well. Who are you looking at? I like both of your answers better than I like my answer here. So just full disclosure, like I I like both of what you put down more than what I put. I, I put Jace Peterson. I am a big fan of going to teams that are not trying to win and finding the dudes who are going to get some playing time and going to get some run. And Jace Peterson projects right now to be the strong side of a platoon. He's not being drafted at all. And he's probably good for 10 to 12 bags. And the athletics are, they have to play 162 baseball games just like everybody else. So they need him out there. They need him doing things. They don't care if he gets thrown out on the bases nearly as much as, say, the Dodgers would care about somebody getting thrown out on the bases. And I think Jace Peterson projected at 10 to 12 bags is probably conservative. Um, he might give you 15 to 20. And that would be potentially very interesting for someone who is going to be on the waiver wire those first couple of weeks of the season. Yeah, I mean, attempted 13 stolen bases last year with just 328 made appearances. So if he can get anything resembling you know, full-time playing period, even for a stretch of time, even if he's in the platoon for the most of the season, but then there's a stretch where they're down a couple player here or there, and he has to pick up some extra, uh, some extra games here or there. He's got a pretty aggressive, twice as aggressive as your average player on the best. I could definitely see him at least holding steady at that, that attempt rate that we saw last year and probably increasing with more, obviously, uh, plate appearances and ability to get on base. Like I said, I cheated. I went with Joey Wendell, all multi-positional eligible at uh, three different positions on NFBC. 
who knows, he might be more if you're on Yahoo or CBS or whatever. Only drafted in three of the last 14 OCs. I, I'm a sucker for the multi-position eligibility, especially a guy like that on your bench with the fact that <laughs> he very well may and may very well be the starting shortstop for the Miami Marlins since they have 17 second basemen on the roster all playing different positions throughout <laughs> around the field. He very he should eclipse his appearances from last year pending health. Of course, obviously Wendell has had his history as well, keeping him off the field for that reason. But he did spend some time last year leading off for the Marlins with John Birdie getting hurt every once in a week. If he finds his way into that spot in the lineup, regardless of the lineup around him, he's going to give himself opportunities to score runs. He's not going to do much else for you. I'm, I'm very well aware of that, but I like him as the, Joey Wendell is going to be a guy that spends a lot of time on my team. He may not be on my roster a hundred percent of the year, but he will be somebody I stream in and out based on the fact that I can plug him into many different positions. And I can trust the fact that he's going to be productive where I need him to be. Miami is also one of those teams, one of those three teams that have eight straight games to start the season. So there's Miami and the New York Mets and Houston all have eight straight games. So he'll get not only the four days of that first weekend on NFBC or of any weekly league, but then he has the next four games straight as well. So that Monday through Friday, not many players you can say that say will have that in. Even if he misses one or two games there, he'll still load up on plate appearances for you. Hopefully, you know, his legs are still fresh from spring training. He can get you a couple backs. Kevin, this was an interesting one because this is somebody that uh, he once said he he was going to show us all off and steal, what, 30, 35 bags in a C50, maybe it was. And then he went on to not even attempt a stolen base, I think, for the first like four months of the season or something like that. I might be wrong on that, maybe being facetious, but I'm pretty close to being no, accurate. You're close. Why is he an option here for you? There is not a whole lot of analysis here. This is a feeling, a hunch, a gut thing. He's still 27 years old. And as far as we know, he's healthy and Tony La Russa is gone. That's what this is all about. What's really intriguing to me is just two seasons ago in 2021, when everybody was disappointed in 14 home runs and three stolen bases, he got on base at a 375 clip in 616 plate appearances. Anything close to that and with health, and we don't know. This is one of those things we got to watch in spring training. We have no idea how the new regime in, in Chicago is going to play the base paths. So they're turning guys loose, including Yohan Mankata in spring training, and he appears to be healthy. This is a guy that just overall, in general, I am more interested in than I have been in years. And it's all about cost. He's not being drafted in 12 team fab leagues, at least not in all of them. He is in a handful at 333 average draft position. This is a spot where you can take a shot on a guy like this, still 27 years old. What's really intriguing to me, all of the projections have him projected for more home runs than he's hit more than one time. And that was 2019. With the oh. ball we had in 2019, they <laughs> all have him for more home runs than he's hit in any other season. So this is a guy that could really surprise us with just a little bit of health, new environment, even though it's with the same team. I think this, the entire clubhouse there in Chicago is now a better place to be for all of these guys. And they might all of a sudden all stay healthier. There, there's something to say for what you're, what, how you're feeling mentally about how you feel physically as well. So this, taking a shot on all these white socks, especially at where Yohan Mankata is being drafted. I, I, you haven't quite, you might've convinced me more about Mankata as a whole. I don't know that you've quite convinced me Mankata for the speed categories. I think it really will matter on where he ends up in the lineup for sure. He's really got to prove to me that, he actually is going to be allowed to run um, because after all those comments, even if I, he gets on base at a three seventy five clip for six hundred plate appearances, I don't care on, where he is in the lineup if he does that. Yeah, <laughs> he'll if he gets on base that often, he's going to score regardless if he actually runs the bases. He'll score, so again, that fits the bill, like you said. All right, I will jump into middle infield here and get my guy out of the way because there's still a possibility that my pick here could negate my Joey Wendell pick in the fact that. 
Elvis Andrews hasn't signed with anybody yet. And if he actually signs with Miami, becomes the shortstop that puts Wendell back into his super utility role, which obviously has been his bread and butter for the last couple of years. We all saw what Elvis Andrews did with the White Sox. And I'm only specifically talking about what he did with the White Sox throughout the course of the season. He's only been drafted in one of the last 14 OCs at pick 326. So readily available on a lot of wires should continue to be by the end of the season. He will start getting drafted as soon as he signs. We see this all the time, especially when he signs with a team that has a hole where he can fill in as an everyday shortstop, possibly moving to second base, wherever he is willing to play. If he's willing to play, if he's willing to play, he's going to play every single day. I still believe that regardless of where he ends up going. He ran throughout the course of the season, both with his times with Oakland in Chicago, about two and a half times as much as your average runner with the opportunities he was given. 22 attempted bases throughout. And this is still a guy who did it with a with a sprint speed pr- pretty much average if not below average sprint speed 26.4 so not the fastest guy still knows how to smartly run the bases with with a over 81% success rate. So above average in that realm as well. The kind of the red line that you are looking for is around the 75, 78% that line for success rate. And that's when you start seeing guys get pulled back. Now that might change going into next year with the new rules like we keep talking about. But if I, if you, that line actually might go up next year in season. If you're still being unsuccessful, even with these new rules, you might, your manager might even be quicker to give you a a red light. So keep an eye on that as well. That's just my theory going in. As Sarah mentioned, people say, we don't know what's going to happen with stolen bases. We do know as Kevin, as you mentioned, that they're going to go up. We just don't know quite how or who's going to do it. Kevin, why don't you hit us up with your middle infielder, somebody we talked about earlier in the episode for different reasons briefly, but why do you think Chris Taylor is an option for this uh, for these categories? I, I just think he's going to be healthy. He wasn't for much of last season. He still stole 10 bases. And where he's being drafted, he qualifies here. He'll get he may not get quite as much playing time with we did mention with the Peralta signing. I think he was the one player that that I brought up may may lose a little bit, but he moves around so much. He's gonna get some playing time. He's gonna steal some bags. I do want to bring up, I've stuck with the old and boring theme for all of these categories. If we hadn't already talked about him so much this offseason, the corner infielder that I'm interested in is Nate Eaton. I was really impressed that you did not put Nate Eaton on here. (laughs) Had to get him in there, though. You've talked about him enough that I brought him up more often than you have, just (laughs) so I can see how much I can get you to talk about Nate Eaton. And you've brushed it aside. You've been like, yeah, I'm not going to talk about him. Yeah, we'll see what his playing time looks like. But Nate Eaton is somebody I'm definitely eyeing on my wires right now as well, especially in the leagues where I didn't have a chance to draft him in the in my deeper spots. All right, finish us off, Sarah, in middle infield as we talk about middle infield. A little bit easier to find the players that are going to run more often, guys that may score more runs just because where they are in the lineup. Who do you have your eye on that fits the bill here? Got two different guys, one that is going to be in a platoon and unfortunately the weak side of a platoon, but I think that he's going to give you more stolen bases. And if there are any injuries in this Mariners lineup, then I think that Dylan Moore is a really interesting person to put on your roster, either in a fab period or as one of your last picks. And then you just hold him. And if if it doesn't look like he's going to get enough playing time, you can drop him. It's not going to cost you very much, but he projects for 20 stolen base potential as the weak side of a platoon, which means that if he starts playing more frequently or there's injuries or anything goes on, that 20 stolen base potential can become 30 or 40 stolen base potential really quickly. And he's going super late. The other guy who, if you are more playing time risk averse, you don't want to draft weak sides of platoons is Tony Kemp, who is to be an outfield eligible. He's going to play a ton for the A's because the athletics don't really have anybody else that they're going to put in those positions and and he's not being drafted right now. He's going to play every day and he's going to give you 10 to 15 bags. So if you like the playing time situation, you pick up Tony Kemp. If you like the risk of playing time, but like maybe an injury gets in the way and you have way more upside, I think you go with a Dylan Moore. I love the Dylan Moore pick. He was somebody that I was in my daily moves leagues grabbing every time I knew he was going to be in the lineup. Simple as that. Just for that. If I needed a, in a head to head, if I needed a stolen base over the weekend, Dylan Moore was my guy. He, he, 
didn't not run. Uh, I'm pretty sure there, he had a game where he had at least two stolen bases in the game, if not three or four. It seemed like that was just who he was. Decent, pretty average success rate as well. And if he continues anything close to the rate in which he was running, if he gets anything more than a weak side of platoon, like you mentioned, yeah, that, that is a very conservative 20 stolen base projection with what he brings to the table. So I like to call out. And if it's lot. daily moves and OBP, you're in business. There you go. Not to mention Seattle is one of the teams that has a four four game slate in the first weekend of games as well. So a lot of volume there. If for some reason he's getting more, like you said, more than that weak side platoon. All right. I think there's a lot of players that you can you should really be watching in the final three rounds of your 12 teamers, even close to the final couple rounds of your 15 teamers as well. And definite targets in draft and holds that are obviously going to be drafted in those formats, but you could probably grab them a little bit later to fill the gaps in the speed categories. Both the runs, these guys that end up being closer to the top, if not at the top of the lineup or in the nine hole. I think that's an un that's a situation in which you forget about a lot of times that's your second leadoff hitter if you will they don't get as many plate appearances obviously throughout the course of the game but you're still right there at the top before your one two three hitters come up to bat who have a good chance of knocking you in as long as you can get on base so keep an eye out for runs don't forget about the run category and kevin what else do you have for us as far as general advice as we are almost halfway through february now and getting closer and closer to that quote, March draft season. You brought this up a little bit earlier, talking about the things that we can watch for in spring training and team tendencies with stolen bases are one of those, at least historically. This year is going to be really interesting. We talk about it every single season, about the overreaction to things happening in the first couple of weeks of the season. But there is so much we don't know because there are so many changes being made at the same time that we can't just isolate on what one thing will affect. They're all going to come together that we're almost going to have to overreact this season or we're going to be too late. The hard part is going to be overreacting to the correct things. So just something to keep in mind. We're going to have to really pay attention in spring training in the first couple of weeks of the season and make some tough decisions that normally we'd probably advise waiting a little while before making those decisions. I think this season we have to jump at some things. And I think that is a general piece of advice that we give. Kevin, you're really the spearhead of that. If you wait too long, you probably waited too long. It's probably too late in general. And I think it probably to the nth degree will uh, will go into the 2023 season into April as well. So I think it's a good call out just mentally preparing yourself for the kind of moves that you're going to have to make early and often. That um, means making drops we don't want to make. That's yeah. going to be tough. I say this all the time. I'm going to continue to say this. Remember, especially in your weekly fab leagues, you drop somebody, it doesn't mean you can't get them back. It doesn't right. mean you can't be in on the bidding to get them back. That's what I'm saying. Don't be too afraid to drop somebody, especially if you have the budget to spend to bring them back if it matches what your team needs. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us to talk about some speed options, both late in drafts and just as a general strategy throughout the course of your drafts. I'm looking forward to seeing you in person at the Glarf draft in Chicago coming up when less than a month away on that. What else do you have going on besides being on every other podcast? <laughs> <laughs> I've been on a lot of podcasts lately, yeah. but but part of that is I like talking fantasy baseball with people. This is a really fun time of year. And with all the new rules changes, there's so much for us to speculate on and to think about and to ideate on. And I love that, man. That's the best part of baseball. Like, what does 2.5 extra inches mean? I don't know. <laughs> We're all going to find it out together. You can find me and those takes at BCB underscore Sarah. No H on the Sarah on Twitter. And you'll be able to find all of my next moves there. I wish I could be a little bit more specific right now, but it does seem the formerly known as SB Nation podcasts are all going to come together in a way that is going to be wicked cool. And I hope that you'll be interested in the Cubs content there if you're a Cubs fan. But even if you're not a Cubs fan, I think we're going to have some really cool fantasy content over there. And I'm excited to get this fantasy show up and running for early March. So definitely stay tuned for that. I appreciate awesome. the fact I knew that you spent time in Boston, but your Wicked came out there, and I greatly <laughs> appreciate that. What's so funny about that is that you are like the fifth person who has randomly told me your Boston is showing, and I'm like, I don't think I, I don't think I have a Boston accent still, but I think it does come out on occasion, especially if I'm talking about hockey. By the way, the Bruins are absolutely killing it. Go bees! Yeah, there you go. 
All right. At least somebody is. I mean, Celtics are doing well too. Yeah. I grew up in Western Massachusetts, so I never got an accent. I lived in Boston for a couple of years before moving to the Bay, but the Wicked's it took a long time for the wickets to really completely get out of my vocabulary. And every once in a while, one will, one will slip up. So I always appreciate hearing one in the wild, especially not from some, not from one of my like hometown friends. So thank you for that. <laughs> you are welcome. I'm happy to oblige. All right, All right guys, that's going to do it for episode 102 of On The Wire. Make sure you are following all of Sarah's work, as she mentioned, at BCB underscore Sarah. Of course, no H on the Sarah. You should already be following the pod on the Twitter as well, on The Wire pod, right after giving us a rating review, of course, wherever you are listening. And that's going to wrap it up. To once again, thank our guest Sarah Sanchez for joining us. And after all that, I am Adam Howe. On behalf of Kevin Hastings, thanks for listening. And we bid you goodbye. Aloha, everybody. Start clean with Clorox because Clorox delivers a powerful clean every time. Because messes happen. Because... Hey, honey, you know your dad's world-famous chili. Yeah, the one that takes 24 hours to make. So I was trying to help out and bring the pot to the table, but it was, like, super hot. And then I, um, dropped it. And now the floor looks all, you know, stained with chili. Look, the point is, you guys cool with pizza for dinner? (laughs) Honey? Ooh, yeah, that happens. So start clean with Clorox. Use Clorox products as directed. Sometimes your cat can be a mystery, like when they get so attached to certain cardboard boxes. (laughs) But when you use Fresh Step Cat Litter, there's no question that you're making your cat happy. Thanks to amazing odor control, Fresh Step Clumping Cat Litters prevent stinky crumbles and make scooping easy by locking in liquid and odor immediately. That means you can keep your house clean and your bond strong. There's no mystery here. Find Fresh Step Cat Litter at a store near you. Fresh Step is a registered trademark of the Clorox Pet Products Company. Certain trademarks used under license from the Procter & Gamble Company or its affiliates.